Well, hi everybody. We're here because we're ticked off today. We're going to talk about Lyme disease, right, Dr. Let's Bailey? Do Let's do it. Let's do it. GBMC Live. I'm Diane Lynn from today's 101.9. Dr. Theodore Bailey is here from GBMC Infectious Disease. And I got to tell you something. I wore these especially for you because I thought, well, we're doing Lyme disease, right? Perfect pants. And I did spray some bug repellent on here. So we're safe. As you should. Okay. So what is Lyme disease? So it's in the news. So that's one thing. It's mm -hmm. certainly. Uh, disease of, if not the year of the decade perhaps, um, because it is a parasitic bacterial disease that we have in the U.S. So other countries, we hear about malaria, they have their own exotic diseases, mm -hmm. but one that you can pick up coming to the U.S. and also in Europe um, is Lyme disease. And it's something that we get from ticks, as you mentioned. Um, and we happen to be in one of the top seven states in the U.S. Uh, wow. in terms of the number of people who get it every year. So here, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, but also in the Midwest, uh, these are the, the big states. Is there a reason for that, doctor? Well, because it's an insect-borne infection, you have to have the right insect. Okay. And so the tick that carries it, which is the deer tick, the, the black leg tick, okay. uh, happens to be in these areas. And there's also a, a, a rim of uh, a related tick on the west coast that can also transmit it. Okay. Now, you know, let's just say it, the girls out front were saying, oh, I got bit by a tick, I think, the other day. So how does somebody know they've got Lyme disease? What are the symptoms? Well, the problem with, I mean, the challenge there is that the symptoms that we get from Lyme are not, for the most part, unique to Lyme. And so the things that might lead you to suspect it would be that you've had a recent tick. Uh, the classic symptom, the one that's the most closely associated with Lyme, uh, is the so-called erythema migrans. That's a bullseye rash. Okay. Um, and that can form within three days to a few weeks uh, at the point of the tick bite. And some people will see the rash and never remember the tick bite. Um, that's specific to it. We see that with one other kind of illness called STARI, Southern Tick Associated Rash Illness. But apart from those two illnesses, we don't see much else that causes that rash. Um, and so that will usually be a trigger to get put onto treatment for it. But not everybody gets that. And even if they get it, they may not notice it. It could be on the back. It could be somewhere where they can't see it. And so over a course of weeks to months to, believe it or not, years, uh, you might get a set of other symptoms. And it can affect uh, different parts of the body. Uh, some of the classic places would be the joints. Uh, we discovered Lyme disease in, of all places, Lyme, Connecticut. A, a coincidence, I'm sure. Um, and it came to light because there were a lot of young children who were getting, surprisingly, arthritis. And you don't expect to see arthritis in children. You know, most people would think they came from Lyme. You know, the, the fruit. You, so it's spelled differently. <laughs> right, but Lyme, Connecticut makes sense, L-Y-M-E. That's right. Yeah. Um, so it came to light with arthritis. So that's something that you can get years later, you can mm -hmm. get months later. Uh, it can often invo involve the knee, but it can involve other joints as well. Uh, and it's really, it's inflammatory, it's warm, the knee gets stiff and it's not working. And it, over time it can be destructive to the joint. So that's, that's one. Uh, it can actually affect the heart too. So there can be really? heart infection with Lyme. And that can lead to rhythm issues all the way to the point that you would have to have a pacemaker potentially. Uh, it can also cause infections of the brain and the lining around the brain. Is that encephalitis? Encephalitis and meningitis. Okay. Uh, it can also affect the nerves of the face, so one of the classic uh, things is called Bell's palsy. Mm -hmm. And that's where one side of the face droops as if you had a stroke. Uh, and it's because the nerves that run to the muscles of the face have been affected by the infection. Uh, it can also just cause fevers, chills, muscle aches, uh, fatigue. Uh, it can cause a fogginess in our thinking. So there are a lot of symptoms that are not unique to Lyme. Lots of other things can cause that. Uh, and that's what would lead someone to start testing for Lyme, but hopefully testing for other things. Would you consider this now an autoimmune disorder because of the joint and the inflammation factor? And autoimmune disease, for people that don't know what that is, that's something that is just throughout your body, when your body kind of attacks itself. So could this virus that from the tick? Bacteria, bacteria. Bacteria, sorry. But this bacteria from the tick cause something like that? Well, it's one of the things that's being considered. Uh, because there is a condition that's called post-treatment uh, Lyme disease syndrome. And we do see people who, even after they've been treated with the antibiotic that treats and, and kills the bacteria, may have symptoms that last for months, and in some cases, symptoms that last indefinitely. And one thought is that as your immune system is exposed to Lyme disease, in the process of developing a response that reacts to that bacteria, you may also be starting to develop a reaction against some part of yourself. Okay. So it's, it's possible. It's not well established, um, but it would be one of the hypotheses for how we have these long-lasting symptoms after Lyme disease. Okay, off the script here, and I just thought about this, and I had a spider bite years ago, and there was a lump in the back of my head, and I was in the Outer Banks, 
didn't know until we found one of those, and it wasn't a brown spider, but a dark spider mm -hmm. that was in the room. My doctor said, oh, you should have come home and had a round of antibiotics to take care of the bacteria. Well, that's Could have a, been, you know, something serious. So in that case, what they're talking about is, is MRSA or Staph aureus. So, okay. And that's because the, the is often introduced at that time, or the infections look a lot like, like a spider bite. Okay. Kind of black, swollen, yeah. tender. Um, I had but, a lump. I didn't know what it was, you know, it just popped up. So, but in this case, that's, you're talking about five days of treatment. With the Lyme, we're talking uh, more in the order of about seven to 14 days to okay. 21 days. And for the arthritis, uh, even 28 days of treatment. Okay. Uh, we're taking your questions on Facebook, and we've got a bunch already here. You're popular, Dr. Bailey. And no, I think no, Lyme is popular. You are too. You're doing a great job here with us today. So gbmc.org slash intercom Baltimore. We'll be taking questions after, too, if you want to do a private question, or you just think of something after the broadcast, because it's only 30 minutes long. But I guess one of the biggest questions is, how do you successfully remove a tick? I know back in the day, mm -hmm. grandfather would bring out the pliers, oh, I'll get it on the farm, you know, but sometimes that's a problem, right? Well, that's closest to being right. Okay. So the, the things that are more problematic would be, say, putting petroleum jelly over it, trying mm -hmm. to smother it out, lighting a match to the body. Actually, the preferred method would be to take, not pliers, but tweezers, okay. something a little bit more precise, getting it down as close to the head, which is burrowed into the skin, and then pulling in a smooth motion up. Uh, to remove him. Okay. And what you want to do also is make sure you take care of the skin after that. So we recommend either iodine. Uh, you can also use soap and water after that. Um, but you do want to do a little bit of skin cleaning as well. What happens if you leave the little guy in there? What? Well, go to the doctor immediately? What? Well, you also keep the tick because okay. there's only certain ticks that are going Evidence. to be the Lyme. And so you can bring that to your doctor, who's going to be the one who prescribe the medicines, okay. uh, to confirm that it's the right type of tick and also that it's in the right stage. So the, the Iotes tick, the tick that transmits Lyme, really has three life stages. And it's in the nymph stage, sort of the middle stage, uh, where he's able to transmit the Lyme. Okay. And, he, and the other thing to put in there is he needs to really be in place 24 hours or more, which is a powerful thing for us because if you go out into the woods, come back in and make a regular habit out of checking your scalp or checking your children's scalps and, and reciprocating, uh, you're going to be getting ticks off before they've had a chance to be on for 24 hours and that's going to prevent them from transmitting the Lyme even if they have it in them. Okay, so are there better products out there to protect us? I know I said bug repellent on my pants, but you know, do you have, uh, is citronella a good thing? Is there something that maybe moms, you know, mm -hmm. they want to be more organic and, and not have anything they think are pesticides? What's your opinion on that? Well, so I tend to favor the, what's effective okay. rather than what's fashionable. And so okay. deep containing personal uh, insect repellent is, is effective. So applying that to your person, but also you know wearing protective covering clothes. It's it's great to go out. It's hard not to go out with short sleeves and, and shorts on. But if you're wearing more protective clothing, uh, longer sleeves, and then your gear and your clothes have permethrin uh, in them, uh, you're going to be that much more protected against it. Hats as well. These guys don't jump. They they really drop down on you or they brush off as you as you move through. To the blades of grass, yeah. So having yourself covered uh, and having repellent is really quite effective. That's the best way. It's sort of like a sunburn, you know. Get yourself protected protected, have yourself covered. Okay, so we have a question, you ready? Sure. This is from Kim. My four-year-old was bitten in June. I removed the tick that day and about two weeks later, I had a swollen, painful bullseye rash around her ear. She was prescribed two weeks of antibiotics. Also, her Lyme test came back negative, though that doctor felt certain she had it. In fact, um, that she contracted this disease, the doctor thought. So are we likely safe, she says, with just two weeks of antibiotics since we're certainly caught it early? Do I need to keep an eye out for anything? And here's the bonus question for mm -hmm, you. Mm -hmm. Should we spend the money for an IgenX test to check for co-infections? So these are good, that's a good combo of questions and that's a thoughtful parent. Um, so they recognize, very astutely recognize the rash. Mm -hmm. um, in this area, it's, it's going to be Lyme. There is another condition, as I said, called starry that we see a little bit further south. And caught that early at the stage of the rash itself, um, that duration is textbook. So two weeks, 
uh, is just right. Docs, and I think that you would have used amoxicillin. Okay. Right? Um, in children who are eight years or younger, um, they're still forming their bone, they're still forming their teeth, and you don't want to use the classic medication, which is doxycycline, so you would okay. use amoxicillin. Okay. Um, but the two weeks would be, would be right on. Okay. Um, and some other, so you might want to do um, testing for co-infection because it's a child. Because since you didn't use doxycycline, there's a chance that you didn't treat some of the things that can be carried along with uh, Lyme in the Iotes tick. It does carry other infections. Not always, really? okay. but that tick is capable of having other things on board. So Scary. one of those infections is anaplasma. Now, often not a big deal because doxycycline treats that as well as treating Lyme. But in a child, you're not going to use doxycycline, so you might want to test and see if, in fact, they acquired anaplasma. Okay. Now, if you're allergic to amoxicillin, what do you do then? Well, then you, there's another class of medications called cephalosporins. And okay. only, only about one out of seven people who have allergies to the penicillins are going to have issues with the cephalosporins. Okay. So cefuroxime or ceftriaxone uh, are often used in those situations. There's also something more. Even if those aren't usable because you're allergic to those, there's a mechanism to desensitize people. Okay. We're able to expose them to little bits and little bits more and a little bit more and get them to the point that their body will ignore for a short time the antibiotic and then you can still use it. If you're just joining us, we're at GBMC Live, GBMC Healthcare, Dr. Theodore Bailey is here and he's an infectious disease guy. I could talk to him all day because he's fascinating. He knows all about bacteria and we're getting down on Lyme disease today. So if you've had a recent tick bite or you think you might have, you know, we'll take your questions. We're here for a little while at gbmc.org slash intercom Baltimore. So we got another one and it's from Laura mm -hmm. and she says, how similar are the symptoms to rheumatoid arthritis? What makes them different and we talked about joint pain earlier so sort of in the same class same family right so what's the difference well not in the same I mean so that is a classic autoimmune disease okay. that's, a, that's, a, that's a condition driven solely by your own immune systems development of a reaction that works on joints but not only people can get nodules so there are these sort of called um, rheumatoid nodules that they can get on the on their arms mm -hmm. that's distinct you're not going to see the bullseye rash um, it's not a cause of meningitis or heart infection. Uh, you know, it does cause an arthritis that can be fairly similar in appearance. It's inflammatory, red, hot, warm, uh, in a lot of ways like a Lyme arthritis would be. Um, but you can tap that um, and actually test directly on the fluid for Lyme disease, which is the organism is Borrelia. I should, I should be more precise. You're testing for the Borrelia organism. You're testing for its DNA. Okay. So, you know, that would be negative uh, in rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, it would be positive uh, in Lyme. Also, the testing is different. So in, with Lyme disease, you're going to go test for antibodies against Lyme as the diagnostic test. For rheumatoid arthritis, you're going to test for something called the rheumatoid factor or another uh, test called CCP. Those are tests that are, that are different. They're getting, and blood work, right? It's all blood. Those are okay. blood work, yes, ma'am. Okay. I, you know, I was doing some research to be ready for you because I wanted to, you know, be up to speed on everything because you're the expert. I'm not. But I read somewhere that it can cause a condition called fibromyalgia. Um, Lyme disease, something like that. Um, fibromyalgia also is sort of an autoimmune disorder um, uh, that kind of affects the whole body. Well, I, I would I would back off the autoimmune part of it. It's 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 probably more of a dysfunction in how we gate and regulate pain sensation. Okay. Um, as opposed to an inflammatory condition. There okay. are there are true inflammatory conditions that are a lot like it, like polymyalgia rheumatica. That's an inflammatory yes, condition. Yes, saw that but, too. But um, with fibromyalgia, it, it tends to be more of a pain syndrome. It has s symptoms that are similar to Lyme, uh, and I think that that's why there's some potential confusion. Okay. And I think it's a little bit like if you find uh, a fire out in the woods, was it caused by a lighter, was it caused by a match, was it caused by a magnifying glass in the sun or two rocks? The fire is the fire. It looks a lot the same, irregardless of what the cause of it is. So those symptoms um, that we associate with uh, Lyme disease can, be, can come from other causes. Okay. And, it, and that's why it's actually important when you're confronting somebody or even work, looking into this for yourself um, that, you, that you look at the other things that can cause that same set of symptoms because Lyme is far and away not the only thing that can cause that set of symptoms. So testing is so important. Testing and, not, and, and again, not just narrowing in on, on Lyme. Uh, it does a disservice either to your patients if you're a doctor or to yourself if you're, if you're looking into your own symptoms. Can tick-borne illnesses be transmitted from person to person? Is that true? Yes, so really? some, some can be. So this, again, it, it, you have to get down to cases. 
So um, we know that there are um, transfusion transmitted uh, infections that are tick-borne. So uh, you can transmit an infection called Ehrlichia with transfusions and you can transmit something called Babesia. These are primarily picked up by ticks, but if you happen to be someone who has the infection and if you were to give blood and there wasn't adequate testing, uh, you could transmit that and there are cases of transfusion related uh, transmission. That's good to know. I didn't know that. Another question for you. Can Lyme disease give you a high ANA tilter? My son has been diagnosed with lupus but has always spent a lot of time outdoors. He's now 25 and a field biologist and we wonder if it's really Lyme disease. Uh, he's kind of dealing with it. Any thoughts on that, doctor? Yeah, so that, that would not be something that would be caused by Lyme, but okay. uh, that's something that we associate, I think, as the, as the questioner mentioned, with lupus. Uh, it, that's a classic autoimmune condition where you've developed a set of antibodies, not to parts of the Lyme bacteria, but to parts of yourself. And those are not molecularly similar, so they're not, it's not a driver for the development of those things. Um, it can cause arthritis, it can cause a number of symptoms that feel like Lyme in some respects, but it's treated differently. You would treat that um, with immune suppression, and you would treat other autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis with immune suppression, not with antibiotics, whereas you would treat Lyme disease with antibiotics. Sort of like a co-infection there that well, we to talked about earlier. Well, that's the thing. So, so people who have lupus, unfortunately, don't get a free pass not to get infected, not to be bit by ticks, and people who are bit by ticks don't get a free pass not to develop over the course of their lifetime other medical problems such as lupus. So unfortunately, and you can think about Job in the Bible, but we can, we can be given quite a large burden of problems all at the same time that aren't related to one another. Okay, another question. My son has Lyme disease after an episode last summer, and I'm super concerned, having trouble finding a pediatrician that specializes in Lyme and who will take care of him. I need to have him retested and to see what we can do. So what are your recommendations, Dr. Bailey? Well, so that's, that's a good question. I happen to come from an exclusively adult infectious disease department uh, at GBMC, so we're not, we're not med peds or not adult peds. Um, but there are, your, your, this patient and uh, their families lucky to be in Baltimore because we do have really some outstanding academic programs here. So both the University of Maryland and uh, uh, Hopkins have pediatric infectious disease specialists. So I think those would be fine places to start. Okay. If you have a question, gbmc.org slash intercom Baltimore. We are here with you for a few more minutes talking Lyme disease and our specialist, Dr. Theodore Bailey. I'm Diane Lynn from today's 101.9. I got another question. You ready? Yes, please. <laughs> They're just coming at us now. Here, uh, This is from Natalia. As an outpatient physical therapist, I have seen numerous patients being misdiagnosed. A lot of times these patients have been seen by numerous providers, which is always so frustrating, and they've been screened for Lyme, tested negative, only later to test positive for hidden Lyme, hidden Lyme. So what suggestions should you give those patients when they suspect Lyme and who to see or what tests to ask for? And what is hidden Lyme? So we don't, it's not a technical term. What I would suspect it means is the idea that they have a Lyme disease that didn't show up in testing, but that's not a... Um, well-proven category. Okay. We do know that testing, if you take everyone who has Lyme, regardless of what stage they have, we know that the test comes up 65% of the time positive. But the, what's a little bit deceptive about that is that what the test is testing for are the antibodies that your immune system makes against Lyme. And that generation of antibodies is not an instantaneous process. The immune system has to see it, be exposed to it for a period of time before it starts to react to it. It's the same principle behind vaccinations. Uh, our immune system is designed to gear up uh, in reaction to exposures. So what we're testing in Lyme is different in, than what we test in a lot of other infections where we're testing directly for the infection. Like if I'm testing for HIV, I'm, I'm testing for the presence of its DNA, or, which I should say is RNA. Um, but with uh, Lyme, we're testing indirectly. We're testing for whether you're making antibodies against it, whether your body's ever been exposed to it. And that takes time to happen. So if you set aside the people who are in the first four weeks or so, and they might have a rash, they might already have symptoms of swollen lymph nodes, fevers, aches, um, and, and feel ill, but their testing will be negative because it's so early into the infection. If you take the people that are four weeks out or more, the test actually becomes fairly sensitive and picks up a, a large percentage of these. So I think she might be alluding to the idea that some people have Lyme symptoms, but their testing is negative. And that's, that goes to the second part of her question, what tests should they order? Yeah. And as soon as you're thinking about Lyme disease, 
you should actually be thinking about a very wide range of other conditions. Uh, there are a large range of other tick-borne uh, illnesses that even come from other ticks um, whose symptoms overlap substantially with Lyme. And then there are a number of other conditions depending on what the symptoms are. We talked about rheumatoid arthritis, for instance. So autoimmune conditions can overlap with some parts of what Lyme feels like. Um, there are other infections that can generate much the same set of symptoms. And so you have to be looking at the range of things. So I think that the folks who, who aren't taking it seriously are those folks who sort of jump in and, and test only for one of the possible causes of the symptoms that the patient complains about. But what the patient cares about is feeling ill. You know, they don't, have a, they don't have a dog in the fight about the cause. They want to sort of get that under control, whatever the cause happens to be. It's the symptoms that matter. And getting a diagnosis of Lyme is useful if that's the cause of your symptoms, but missing a diagnosis of another cause um, does a great disservice to the patient. Okay, I've got two questions, but I think Media Mindy over here, who is with GVMC, has a live question for us. Go. We do. Um, it's from Cheryl. She's watching on Facebook. So, hi, Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. Um, she wants to know what are typical cardiac symptoms related to Lyme disease? Uh, so the, the big ones would be palpitations, a sense of a, an extra strong heartbeat, uh, and an irregular heartbeat. And that's how it's going to feel to you. Now, when, it, when you get hooked up to an EKG by a uh, physician or um, nurse practitioner, what they're going to start to see is uh, what we call heart block. That's the classic abnormality in the heart rhythm that generates that sensation. And that's something that's correctable with antibiotics in most cases. Rarely somebody might need a pacemaker to, to deal with that. But, but the symptoms are irregular heartbeat. That's a good question, Cheryl. Thank you so much. Do we have another one? This one's actually my question. Oh, good. good. <laughs> so um, I know typically the, correct me if I'm wrong, the ticks that carry Lyme disease are really small. Is that correct? They are the size of the letter D on, on a dime. You know, it tells you where, where this was minted. So the, that is the, very that's, little. Yeah. The ticks that, you know, you'll go out with your kids and, and mm -hmm. pick them off of your kids, do they carry any? The so, ones that you can see more easily. So you're talking about dog ticks, like yes. these, these big engorged guys. And unfortunately, they also do carry uh, infections. So we can see things like Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, and that's why actually not only capturing the tick to confirm that it's a Lyme tick, it's not so much to confirm that it's a Lyme tick, it's so that whatever kind of tick it is, you're going to know the things that it might carry and be able to test for those appropriately. So there are, there are dog ticks. Um, there are uh, soft ticks. Um, there are Gulf Coast ticks, there are Lone Star ticks, all of these different ticks each have their own set of infections that they carry with them. Um, and the symptoms are often quite similar between them and Lyme. And so when someone tests negative for Lyme, it's often time to start thinking about the other things that they could have picked up. Okay, I have two questions. Yes, please. Okay, so is it possible to get infected year round even, especially when it's freezing out? Is it possible? Yeah. It, I mean, so, and think about it this way. Um, ticks don't go extinct, right? So for, for there to be ticks the next year, the ticks have to live through the year. Now, there are high seasons for ticks, but okay. in theory, ticks are persisting through the year. Um, they have to for there to be ticks the next year. And so there can be uh, infections that are acquired later in the year. We're in an area that's... That, uh, that's more likely. Minnesota, perhaps less so. I know because uh, my vet will say to me, I have, I have a kitty at home, you've mm -hmm. got to keep them on the medication for flea and ticks throughout the year because you just mm -hmm. never know. Because well, they, they can come inside. Yep. Um, and, and we do recommend that you have your animals in, you know, taken care of from that perspective because they can bring in sure. uh, ticks and other uh, sources of infection. Okay. Pregnant moms just found out she had Lyme disease. What does she do? Will this affect her breast milk? There's, there's no documented transmission of it uh, in the breast milk, but the issue is one of the antibiotics that, sh that we would normally reach for, she should not be given, and that would be doxycycline. Okay. Doxycycline will be excreted in the breast milk, and it does go into developing bones, developing teeth, and it can permanently stain them and, and alter them. So, so you would want to be vigilant as you're thinking about her um, and put her on something different. And again, it could be amoxicillin, it could be one of these cephalosporins. Okay. Um, but we wouldn't worry about her transmitting. Now, what we might worry about is how did she get exposed? So we will see household contacts, which is what sometimes will lead us to think, could it be transmitted directly from person to person? But what it often means is that people are sharing environmental exposures. You know, they're, they're close together. Ticks can certainly come into a house 
and then move move across. Wow. So, so it's it's also not a bad idea for household contacts to be tested together. Um, and you might pick up a case that has not become symptomatic and head it off before it does. Especially for a pregnant mom, that's good to know. That's good to know. If you have a question, we've only got five minutes left. So that's okay, no worries, because after we go off Facebook Live, GBMC will answer your questions, and Dr. Bailey will do that personally because this is an important topic, Lyme disease. So it's gbmc.org slash intercom Baltimore. You know, when I did the research, too, mm -hmm. I didn't realize that there are so many people in the limelight. Had to throw that in there because we're talking mm -hmm. Lyme mm -hmm. disease. A lot of celebrities that are, you know, know crippled with the disease and I don't mean physically but just because of it being such a systematic um, disease Chris Christopherson they thought he had Alzheimer's and mm -hmm. depression until they tested him for Lyme mm -hmm. uh, Alec Baldwin former president George W Bush Ben Stiller Richard Gere singer Avril Lavigne I remember she had to cancel her tour because she said here quote I had no idea a bug bite could have done this I was bedridden for five months mm -hmm. she said she believed she was bitten by a tick in the spring of 2014 and she says quote I felt like I couldn't breathe mm -hmm. I couldn't talk I couldn't move she thought I thought I was dying. Scary stuff, Dr. Bailey, as we wrap up our Lyme disease discussion. Well, it, it points out the, the, the thing that there's nothing that makes us immune to Lyme disease, unfortunately. Uh, we don't, there's not a vaccine to it, and there's not a walk of life that exempts you from it. Uh, we certainly know that there's certain states where we're seeing transmission, but there's certainly cases detected in essentially every state because people move around, they travel to the areas where Lyme is transmitted, and they may not be taking precautions. Uh, so it's, it's, I think, something we have to be aware of when we're going out into the world. So let's do a little review here, a little wrap up. Uh, check yourself when you come in from the outdoors, especially wooded areas, right? If mm -hmm. you're wearing pants like these, you might want to check yourself because they can get attached to it, not just the design. Um, wear a repellent and, and yes. make sure that you do that all summer long. And check in areas underneath your armpits, places. In, in the groin, they, yeah. they, 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 they will go anywhere. Um, under the hair, so you have yeah. to. That's why it's really most helpful to be able to have a housemate or something like that where you can check each other because it's very difficult. Um, the buddy check system. A buddy check system. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Bailey, you have just put some limelight on our uh, discussion here. You are amazing, and and it is a serious, serious problem. But you know, if we take precautions, check ourselves, and look out for the rash, as you said, and get some medical help immediately. You know, things aren't as gruesome and, you know, not as bad as they seem. That's right. And I want to thank the, the folks who sent the questions in. Those were a lot of thoughtful questions that allowed us, I think, in a very short time to, to cover something that's quite complex. And more questions after the Facebook Live is off the air here in a few moments. Dr. Bailey will answer and also GBMC Healthcare at gbmc.org slash intercom Baltimore. And watch for the next Facebook Live event. They've become very popular here at our studios on Clark View Road. So check it out, gbmc.org. This has been my pleasure. It's nice meeting you. Thank you so much for being here, doctor. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. I'm Diane Lynn from Today's 101.9, and this has been GBMC Live.